Once we're ready, thank you. No problem. Okay, we're ready to start the meeting. Thank you, Sally. Um, thank you, Sally. Welcome to all to the scrutiny meeting this morning and everyone is present from and as we're live streaming this live meeting we will have to hold two zoom meetings separately one for the public items and second for the exempt item once the members are happy to go to the other the exempt meeting everyone need to leave the meeting and then rejoin the next meeting the exempt meeting you can find the links in your invitations on your calendar every microphone will be muted unless you want to sh speak which you show and i will read your name and you need to put your microphone off i would like to remind me members to choose your language of choice as the interpretation is available if you want to speak you would need to use the blue raise hand function and there is also a chat okay uh, I haven't made any apologies, but Councillor Andrew Ward will be a little later in the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Thanks, Sally. Um, Is there anyone else have any apologies for absence? No? Okay. Second, declarations of interest. Hello. Jeff Corey. Yeah. Um, item 8, 1 and 8, 2. Pages 44 and 69. The formal uh, work pro program and the combined work program is the in relation to the disposal of Tia Prince. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, will you be leaving the meeting, Jeff? Um, I don't think he needs to leave. No, it. Okay. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. The, yeah. Long as yeah. I declared it. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the urgent matters. I'm not aware of any uh, chair. Okay, so the fourth item, mean minutes. And before we go on with that, can I just explain, with these minutes, I will be asking for a, a suggestion and a seconder, and they have to be um, members of this committee. Okay. So the minutes um, held on 5th of October. Can I have someone here to suggest those? Is there a proposal? Uh, Nigel Smith, Diachan Waur, and uh, Brian Cossey also raised his hand, so I take him as a seconder. Diachan Waur, you're there, Nagy. Thank you to both of you. Is everyone okay with that? Everybody happy with that? Show of hands, please. Diachan Waur. Thank you very much. Uh, Ivar Lloyd has his hand raised, Chair. I don't know if he was just yes, proposing. Yes, Ivar. No, just in um, Ileoni. Okay, right, moving on. Item Pimp. Fifth Come item up. is the minutes of the informal meetings of the Overview and Scrutiny Committee, Chairs and Vice Chairs. And the meeting that was held on the 19th of October. Is everyone okay with these? Just put your hand up if you are. Thank you very much. The sixth item is the minutes of the Audits and Governance Committee. The minutes that of the meeting that was held on the 30th of September. Everyone happy with this? Everybody happy with this? Show hands, please. Item number seven is the questions to come cabinet members. Okay, thank you, Sally. 
Okay, eight, num item number eight is to review the forward work programs and Dawn's going to take this one over to you. Okay, you'll, members, uh, you'll find the finance and resources and the combined forward plan on pages 38 to 70, 33 rather to 78 of your agenda. Uh, can I just advise you of a couple of changes? So following approval of the business planning framework, I've updated the forward plan accordingly with the caveat that these dates are provisional and due to the uncertainties, we may need to organise special meetings. Um, can I also advise you that the growth deal will be coming to the next finance and resources meeting on the 16th of November with final approval due by council on the 10th of December. That's all I have, Chair. Thank you. On mute, Austin. Thank you, Brian. <clears throat> Um, yes, does anybody want to make a comment? I've got nobody, no blue hands, and I can't see anybody in front of me waving a hand. So we shall take that to a vote. I take it everybody's happy with what Dawn has just said. Um, can I have a show of hands? Yes. Yeah, lovely. Thank you very much. So item number nine to seek a view on the tourism tax task and finish group. I apologize here because Jane isn't here and the chair, the, to the chair Thomas Jones, they can't come here today for this item. I have accepted that we defer this item. And chair. Peter Lewis, sir. Unmute yourself. Uh, yeah. Uh, th thank you, Chair. I, I withdraw my hand now. It's being uh, deferred. Thank All right. You. Okay. Lovely. You, 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 you're too quick off the gun, uh, Peter. <laughs> right. Um, item deg. Can you call it? Item. So the overview and scrutiny representation on the Children and Communities Grant Board and the Housing Support Grant Board. Okay. I've had many people proposals and these are the nominations so the children and communities grant board the nominations are liz roberts pat hebron frank bradfield and the councillors joan vaughan and for the housing support grant board councillors brian cossey aaron win and liz roberts so, so we're going to go into a vote and maybe we'll have to vote twice for these nominations if someone has more than 50% of the votes then we'll take the vote with the lowest number of votes again so only the members of this committee can vote. Okay. Sorry. Anne McCaffrey. Thanks, Chair. Can, I presume we're looking for proposals now, Chair. And if that's the case. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. So can I can I propose Frank Bradfield for the children's board? Yeah. Is there a second of Frank Bradfield? Um, Andrew Hinchcliffe, is that are you seconding? Yes, Andrew Hinchcliffe, right. Any other uh, Proposals, please. Chair, can I nominate uh, Councillor Pat Hebron? Thank you, Chris. Is there a seconder? No, I'm not. I'd like to uh, propose uh, Councillor Joan. The chairman's on mute. You're on mute. Uh, is second for Councillor Joan? Sorry. Can you hear what he's there? Right, can I have Wynne Jones? Uh, Councillor Wynne Jones. Uh, 
Chair, I would like to nominate Liz Roberts for this Children and Communities Grant Board. Liz Roberts. Yeah, Liz Roberts. Do we have a second for Liz Roberts? Yeah, I'm going to ask Aaron Wynn. Aaron Wynn. Um, is there a series? And you can j just uh, switch your mic on and just say so. No, right. Okay, then. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Dawn. Um, that makes it we have a proposer and seconder for Councillor Frank Bradfield, a proposer and seconder for Councillor Liz Roberts, a proposer and seconder for Councillor Joan Vaughan. Yes, Chair, that's correct. So now what we'll do, we'll launch a poll for that one and then we'll go to the housing one second, okay? Thank you. Okay, just bear with us. Whilst we're waiting for Dawn, um, oh, well, she's back now. Sorry, Chair, we're just, lo just uh, loading the, the poll. So like uh, the Chair said, if only those on the committee votes and everybody else just ignore it. I think it's come up on your screen now. Don't forget to press the submit members. Thank you for reminding us, uh, Nigel. Okay, I think that's everybody voted. That's 17 votes. And as Councillor Joan Vaughan has got more than 50% of the votes, she will be uh, appointed to the Children and Communities Grant Board. Congratulations, Joan. Thank you. Thank you, members. Right, um, line and here one board grant come so we'll go on to the housing support grant board. The people who put their names forward are Councillor Brian Cossey, Councillor Aaron Wynn, and Councillor Liz Roberts. Have I got nominations, please? All right, Nigel Smith. I'd like to propose Councillor Brian Cossey. Thank you, Nigel. Jeff Corey, are you seconding that? Yes, I am. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you hear Wynne Jones? Wynne Jones. The, Aaron, Councillor Aaron Wynne, please. Thank you very much. Do we have a seconder for the um, Councillor Aaron Wynne? I'll, I'll second Aaron. Thank you, Chris. Uh, right, Anne McCaffrey. I'd like to propose Councillor Liz Roberts. Thank you. Is there a seconder for Councillor Liz Roberts? Uh, can I see a hand up? No. I will second uh, Councillor Liz Roberts. Okay, so we've got three. Um, and they are Councillor Brian Cossey, Councillor Aaron Wynne and Councillor Liz Roberts. Okay, Chair, we will now launch the vote. Again, can I just remind members, only members who are members of the committee to vote, please? Thank you. Okay, it looks like all members have voted. There's 17 votes. And as Councillor Brian Costi got 65% of the votes, he can be appointed to the housing support grant. Yeah, board. Dawn. Thank you very much, Dawn. And congratulations, mm. Brian. Thank you very much. Thank you, members. Yeah, I'm lying, Annie. Um, we go move forward here to the 11th item, A. So it's a Brexit update. And Barbara Birchall is here. Barbara. 
Barbara, over to you. Good morning, all. Um, I'd like to um, run through a presentation with you. So if you can give me a moment, please, and I will attempt to uh, share my screen with you. I'm not very good at multitasking, so you'll have to um, bear with me if possible. I don't know whether you're able to see that. Yes, we are. You are. Thank you, Councillor Cosby. <laughs> OK, so um, just to introduce, I'm sure you all know me anyway, but just to let you know that I'm um, Principal European Officer, but I'm also the Brexit Lead Officer for Conway. Um, and I'd like to thank you for asking me here today. Um, I hope I can give you a little bit of information about Brexit. Um, how we're dealing with the potential consequences, <clears throat> excuse me, and how it may affect our residents and businesses. Um, the presentation will provide current information. However, the final outcomes on many issues Hello. will not be known for quite some time to come. Um, Hello. So I'll, I'll start by outlining um, the latest position. Um, so the UK officially left the European Union on the 31st of January this year, and in order to continue to negotiate the terms of the withdrawal agreement, there was a transition period until 31st of December, which means the UK is still following EU rules and trade stays the same. However, there will be new rules from the 1st of January, regardless of whether final agreement is reached or what type of deal that may be. Um, although there was a previous deadline of negotiations needing to be complete by the 15th of October, this has now been extended until mid-November. And the mid-November deadline is to give time for the withdrawal agreement to be ratified by all 27 EU member states and the European Parliament before the 31st of December. Um, this slide looks simple, but it's actually probably the one with the most information behind it. Uh, the trade deal options that we're hearing about are being negotiated and they are a Canada style deal, <clears throat> excuse me, which means a free trade between the UK and the EU. Although the EU's agreement with Canada is called the Com Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement or CETA for short. And CETA gets rid of most, but not all tariffs on goods, and it does not remove border checks. Um, and just to remind um, everyone that 45% of all UK exports are to the EU, and 53% of all imports are from the EU. So this deal is quite um, uh, an important one for us. Um, the EU does not have a free trade deal with Australia. So trading on a similar basis to Australia would largely be the same as trading under World Trade Organization rules or WTO. And this is another way of saying the UK would leave with no trade deal in place. And the WTO is the place where countries negotiate the rules of international trade. There are 164 members and every member has a list of tariffs or taxes on imports of goods and quotas, which are the limits on the number of goods that they can apply to other countries with which they don't have a deal. If there's no trade deal at all, the UK would have to trade with the EU on WTO rules, at least initially. Um, and in this scenario, the EU would impose its tariffs on imported UK goods. And the average tariff is pretty low, actually. It's 28% for non-agricultural products. Um, but in some sectors, the tariffs can be quite high, um, with some of them rising to more than 35% for dairy products, for instance. And this will have a big impact on UK businesses selling their goods to the EU. The UK, though, would do the same and impose its tariffs on imported EU goods. And it has already released details of the tariffs it will charge from January two countries with which we don't have a deal. Um, in some areas, these have been imposed to protect UK producers on most agricultural products, for example, to avoid additional disruption for UK farmers 
and consumers. Um, this will lead to higher prices in the UK for some EU goods, um, and it will have to treat the rest of the world in the same way. So we can't have um, good benefits for EU members, for instance. It would have to be the same for everyone. Um, this isn't just a trade deal. Um, there are other areas to be negotiated, like product standards, safety regulations, and sanitary checks on food and animals. Some of them with, will apply with or without a deal, but businesses that trade with Europe fear that no deal in particular could lead to lengthy delays. And eventually negotiations on some kind of deal will still have to begin again. There are other services where cross-border trade exists, and these are professional and business services, financial services, tourism and travel, transportation, road, sea, air and rail, telecoms and IT, etc. And although these aren't restricted by tariffs and border checks, there are national regulations on licensing, quotas, professional qualifications and immigration to be decided. Uh, even though there's still so much uncertainty around the final position by the end of the year, there's still a need to plan so that we can act on the changes that will happen. And this slide shows the planning assumptions that have been made by UK government. Um, so as mentioned, um, tariffs and other trading costs will likely force up prices for consumers on everything from agricultural produce to car parts. Um, the government has now started a campaign for businesses to prepare for the end of the transition period called the Time is Running Out campaign. And you may well have seen this on the TV. There's been quite a few adverts lately. Um, HMRC are writing to 200,000 VAT registered businesses who trade with the EU to set out the new customs and tax rules and how to deal with them. And the government has published a border operating model to give traders the clarity they need to prepare for the new rules. Um, the new border controls will be introduced in three stages up until 1st of July next year. And the government has published a reasonable worst case scenario, which outlines the government's planning assumptions and we're currently reviewing that. So um, that's the boring bit over with really, sorry. <laughs> but that's all the detailed information uh, that you need to be aware of. So how these changes will impact at a Wales level, um, will include obviously the ports. Um, Hollyhead, Fishguard and Pembroke are our main ports, but it also includes Mostyn docks within this region and will require large border checkpoints. Hollyhead is the largest and the busiest in Wales, as you're all aware. And in order to do these checks, the ports don't have the space to undertake this. So they're likely to build um, a structure somewhere inland. Um, I'm assuming it's going to be on Anglesey, but I know that they are looking at Gwynedd as well. There will be checks on imports of products. Um, this should happen from January, but it will be phased in the controls in three stages and border control will then be fully operational by July. Imports will only have a few checks from January and the phasing mainly starts in April where importers will have to pre-notify via a computer system before, excuse me, before they reach the port. Uh, exports will undergo the same phasing, but the EU will have full checks from day one at customs. And in order to export animals to the EU, the UK will need to be listed as a third country and export health certificates will be required for all animal products, not just live animals, but all animal products. Um, the fisheries trade or environmental bill, uh, the Welsh government have fallback options uh, just in case the um, environment bill is not granted, or the agriculture bill, I, excuse me, is not granted royal assent in time. Um, so they will have a standalone bill on direct payment for farmers, which I think is, is crucial for our, um, our area here. And the Welsh Government will publish an overview of its end of transition plan sometime this month. So we're waiting uh, for that to happen to see if there's any further action that is required. Um, on this slide now, we see the potential impacts at Conway level. 
Um, as previously outlined, it's anticipated there will be some impact on jobs, businesses and communities to a greater or lesser degree. Uh, critical supplies could be delayed at border controls, including medicines and foodstuffs. Businesses will require additional support to provide information and guidance on new regulations. Uh, food poverty, which has been increasing due to COVID, is likely to increase with changes to household employment status and income levels, especially at the end of the furlough period, although as we all know that's now been extended for a further month. Uh, but increased food costs due to tariffs will exacerbate the situation for families. And this could be a potential burden uh, in future on our social care services. A disruption in food supplies may affect the supply chain for our school meals. Regulatory services may be involved in dealing with inquiries regarding the export health certificates that um, suppliers will need. Um, and EU citizens uh, working in care homes across Conway who have not yet applied for EU settled status may be ineligible to stay and work in Wales after June. Um, so our response to um, all these sort of issues that are, that are arising is that we've established a project team uh, in Conway, um, the makeup of which is outlined in point 3.1 of your report. Um, and it's chaired by the chief executive and we liaise with portfolio holder for economic development, uh, Councillor Goromwe. Uh, we do hold regular officer meetings um, to discuss the latest information and then amend our risk registers um, accordingly. Information is forwarded to the appropriate officers as it is received or gleaned. And Conway's web pages are constantly updated to provide information for residents, businesses around workplace rights and also to help um, voluntary organisations. So in terms of our risk registers, we have identified corporate risks to businesses and risks also to residents. And the corporate risks include um, EU sourced resources. As a council, we import goods in two areas of significant value from the EU, which is IT and our recycling vehicles. Uh, there's unlikely to be tariffs for IT equipment, so that can continue as normal, but some vehicle tariffs are subject to tariffs which could be up to 10%. And our transport section are reviewing the overall costs of the vehicle replacement programme in light of these additional tariffs. I've mentioned disruption in food deliveries, uh, which could have uh, an impact on school meals. Fuel supply shortages, um, again, could be delays uh, at ports, etc. Um, and obviously fuel shortages for our refuse collection and other council vehicles uh, is something we need to be aware of. Increased project costs. Um, the costs of imported materials may increase, which could see a rise in costs for building projects like 21st century schools, for example. Uh, there will be a need to increase the support uh, and guidance to public and to businesses. Um, corporate risks slide to uh, financial. Um, there may well be a reduction in council tax uh, received and a greater demand on services. As people um, start to lose jobs, etc., then perhaps um, they will look to have their uh, council tax uh, reduced or go on to other benefits. Uh, there will be an increased demand for social care. Um, increase in poverty is likely and possibly homelessness as well. Uh, as well as possible mental health issues with ans various anxieties, not withstanding COVID uh, as well. Um, our legal services uh, may be required uh, to uh, undertake additional work, queries or instructions from client departments for guidance and support. And this is likely to be quite complex work, which will need to be dealt with alongside normal business. Um, loss of access to EU funding for strategic projects. We've received £82 million within EU funds over, since 2001 to deliver 113 projects in Conway. Um, and we're still not quite sure what the replacement funding will be. There will be something, but we're, we're still uh, unclear at the moment. So the risks to businesses 
uh, include tariffs and customs duties, uh, as I've already mentioned. Businesses may be not ready for the change. Again, fuel supply. Loss of trading markets within the EU could affect um, the Welsh farming income. Financial hardship where businesses are already suffering through the COVID uh, lockdown and changes to the common agricultural policy. Uh, this will have a major impact on the farming and rural communities with changes to direct payments to farmers. Uh, we're hoping that um, the Welsh Government will step in with, with um, an alternative, but we're again waiting to hear on that. Um, the risks to our residents include um, obviously the increased costs of imported goods, um, potential impact on medical supplies. Uh, I do know that Betsy Cadwallader and all the other um, uh, health authorities have been asked to stockpile at least six weeks worth of um, supplies in case there are delays on the borders. Um, food poverty and diet related ill health. Um, and it actually leads on to the next one, which is the increased likelihood of food fraud. Um, this is compounded because we used to have, or we will, we do have at the moment, um, EC-wide data systems and intelligence sharing, which we'll, uh, we'll no longer have. Um, so we could have poor quality or unsafe food coming into the market, and they're obviously going to be cheaper, and it may well be what people um, will buy instead. Um, we also have um, care providers where possibly providers are unable to provide safe quality care due to lack of medical devices and clinical consumables, food shortages and increased service costs, um, more reliance on social care services, increased demand at social care first contact points, uh, fuel supply again, and um, obviously fuel supply as well comes into heating homes at the moment in the cold weather as well now that we're in the winter and it will possibly lead, lead to reduced community and personal resilience. Um, the challenge is really um, this all comes at a time when personal and economic resilience is probably at the lowest it's been in many a year. Um, and of course, the challenge of preparing for all this at the same time as the pandemic uh, can't be uh, overestimated. Um, in spite of all that, I'd like to leave you with a quote by T.S. Eliot, which says, if you aren't in over your head, how do you know how tall you are? So we have got challenges ahead of us, but we do feel that we are um, as prepared as we can be. Uh, officers are working diligently on top of, um, you know, of their existing uh, day jobs to try and help uh, our businesses and our residents to make sure that people are as prepared as we can be. And we're just keeping up with the uh, latest information uh, as best we can. So with that, um, thank you very much. And I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Uh, Barbara, Barbara, thank you for that presentation there. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Barbara, thank you very much, thank Barbara, you for, Barbara, for running for us through that. It is a complicated um, period ahead of us. It's been a complicated period before that as well. It's never been easy to uh, work our way through European guidance and European laws but certainly I think there are opportunities as well as challenges ahead of us I'm afraid I'm as not as good as T.S. Eliot's coming up as, as wise words but certainly it's all we can do is, is make sure that we are as an authority as best prepared we can and I think with the help of Barbara and the officers we are as strong as we can be looking forward to the future. There's going to be a heyday, I think, for bureaucracy uh, dealing with this. That, that's the biggest risk. And there will be um, a whole lot of civil servants rubbing their hands with the chance of creating rules uh, unnecessary, hopefully. Uh, hopefully not, but the, that's usually the case. Um, there's the knowns and there's certainly the unknown knowns that we've got to be aware of. Uh, and that's all we can is look at all the guidance that come out of Europe. Look at what's happening in America. That in itself is going to have an impact on the elections there. Uh, as, as we've noticed, Trump is uh, 
would have gone probably for deals with the UK, whereas Biden may not be as helpful as I think Biden is more pro-Europe uh, than uh, Trump. But there are a whole lot of unknowns, but I think we are well-placed. And Barbara certainly uh, has done her homework to keep us well informed. So thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Aronwyn. Uh, Austin. Uh, sorry, do I am to Austin, I'm going to keep the camera off here because my um, connection is really bad. Thank you, Barbara, for that um, presentation. It's quite scary, isn't it? I have some questions, if I can. And the first question is about the exports from the EU from 1st of January. Do we know how much? how many agriculturalists are going to be affected by that and how many is on the mar single market and if we do what does we we'll, what are we going to do to help these farmers no, no much at the moment i'm going to try and find out what i can about this and i can always come back to tell you stuff about that there is many um there's stuff going on at the moment and when we have some thing from this um i'll let you know the wlga is working with the foreign group and i know that a, a lot of information is going on from to farmers from that i can try and find out stuff about that once i know and they have taken place and there was be something from that. Thank you very much. That's okay. Thank you very much. Can I also ask then about the settlement project? Um, I know that from the presentation, there's 10,000 European people in Wales that haven't tried for the application yet. Do we know? How many staff in Conway Council are from the European Union and what support have we given them to try for the settlement project? We've done a lot of information about this. We've put information on the internet. And we don't have any, I don't think, HR trying to look for that from the European Union and fall into that bracket. When we take new staff, we don't ask for where they come from, and that's never been the problem until now. But we don't think we have any staff in Conway which fall into that bracket. We give most information on the internet to try and tell people about this, who are in Conway and working here or living here, to give them information. And we're working with libraries also. And we have a link with Citizens, Citizens Advice Bureau. We have also a link with them to help people who want to fill in forms and such. Thank you very much. Okay, Aaron, thank you very much, Barbara. I'm going to bring the Chief Exec in, Ewan Davis. Yeah, okay, David. Um, I'd just like to thank Barbara for bringing this uh, report to you. Um, we, we wanted to, um, uh, as, 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 as asked for, uh, to explain um, what structure we have in place in order to keep an eye on these things as, as they're progressing. There are there are few, very few levers that we have as a as a council, I believe, in terms of what the the um, uh, the outcomes of the position is going to be. But but we wanted to make it clear to you that we are. Um, I say we. Barbara is all over, uh, as, as you can tell, uh, an absolute expert in, in in this and has a real really good feel for what's going on. Um, I think it's, uh, it's it's also right that I reflect to you that what Barbara has presented. Uh, in terms of risks, are, are, the, are, are, are that, they're risks. They're not things that we are predicting will happen, but in the nature of any sort of risk register, um, you, you, you will uh, inevitably um, highlight risks rather than necessarily opportunities. 
there, 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 there may well be opportunities, who knows? Um, but, but and time will tell. It's, it's yeah, 18 months or so ago, um, Brexit was what one of our biggest areas of concern um, as a nation, I think, and, 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 and as a county borough, of course, that's been put into uh, a huge perspective given the last uh, seven or eight months that we've, we've been going through. Um, but but th things will change and there will be there will, there will be consequences. But I just wanted to, 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 to cover those two things. One, thanks to Barbara, for not just for the report, but for her diligence in covering all of these issues, but just highlighting that what, what was being presented is the risks, not the not not our predictions. Thanks. Uh, Iwan, right. I've got Councillor Chris Hughes and, and McCaffrey. Uh, thanks, Chair. And like Aaron, I'm having difficulty with my um, connection today, so I'm uh, leaving the video off. I, I, I wanted to thank officers for the report. Um, I think I, I I asked for this at the last meeting because of the discussions that were going on at the time. I think it's really, you know, we all get the the national information almost on a daily basis. Sometimes we get sick of the information we get. We get too much information, but it is and has proven at times to be difficult to get the local information. So I'm really, really grateful to uh, the officers for bringing this before us today, because it it does help and as understand what those risks are when we're talking to residents and to uh, businesses. But I'm sure as we get closer and closer, there will be more and more inquiries and um, we need that information in order to be able to respond adequately to people's uh, concerns. So thank you to everyone for that information today. Dear Chris, uh, Anne McCaffrey. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Barbara. Um, my questions are around the resource sort of implications of, of all of this, Barbara. And obviously, I, I read with quite interest on 6.2 that we've actually had some transition funding from WLGA via Welsh Government. Um, I'm quite, quite keen to understand what does that look like in terms of how much, as opposed to um, how much was funded and indeed how much was, was not funded really. Um, and then more importantly, I mean, obviously we're in a forward planning phase now. Um, presumably part of your forward plans are about what sort of implementation resource is needed. Um, for the different scenarios that, that could actually become reality from the 1st of Jan. So I just wondered what those resource plans sort of looked like and indeed the sort of funding requirement. You know, we've, we've talked about impact on food. There's obviously going to be differences in terms of sort of legislation. There's obviously going to be a massive impact in terms of businesses who are actually going to be looking for sort of support and direction. So just wondered about, about the future plans and resource requirement. Thanks, Barbara. Thanks, Councillor Ann. Yes, we received um, funding from the WLGA, oh gosh, some 18 months ago, I think. Um, and it's, it's come through in, in various uh, little tranches for specific things. So um, initially, we had some money to resource the, um, the actual looking at this uh, EU uh, scenarios, really, um, as consequences of Brexit. So we, see, we received that um, funding. We also received funding um, to help our regulatory services with the export health certificates. Um, the, some of the transition funding we have used um, to send out information to um, residents and to businesses. So that's some of it has been used for that. We also had a tranche of money which was looking at food poverty. And specifically that has gone out to our... Uh, 10 food banks within the authority area um, and there is some more uh, money on the way to the recognised food banks so that has been supported as well out of the money. Um, there is also funding to look at regulatory services and the export health certificates that will be required so um, the officers within the various services are aware that this funding is there we've drawn it down from the WLGA as requested we are holding it um, until we know what additional resource we need and then we can use that then to fund that resource. So at the moment, the only things that have been spent on really are around the food poverty, which um, went out um, early on in the COVID lockdown. 
Um, and as I said, there is a second tranche now available. We are contacting our um, food banks to see uh, if they are requiring any further uh, funding. So we are we are holding the funds and we are we're just yeah. waiting to see what additional resource we need. Yeah. But we can call on that funding if required. So, so thanks for that, Barbara. And just before you perhaps answer my sort of second part of the question, just on, on your answer to date, there's, a, there's an organisation set up locally here in the sort of Pemamar de Gwoche area called Pobble Pen. And like Food Bank, it's, it's providing um, food um, to people in need across the, the local area, de Gwoche, Kapililo, um, and Pemamar. And I'm not sure if the scope of funding that you're talking about would be able to incorporate them because they're doing fantastic work and have actually sort of set up in essence a, a kitchen within our local community hall. So I just, perhaps you could answer that, that before you go on to the, the, the future resource question. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure it's something that we could um, look at Councillor Anne. I'm, I'm sure there are those all across the county. We only have a finite amount of money left yeah. Um, within the funding so um, it will just um, uh, we are working with revenues and benefits so um, where people are approaching our benefits department they're being directed to specific food banks uh, within Conway and those are the food banks that we are mm. supporting because we're actually directing our residents to them so um, but certainly if you'd like to send me some information on yeah. bubble plan, then we can we can certainly have a look at that as well Fantastic. Not a problem. Yeah. And then what about future resource requirements, you know, as we move from forward planning into the implementation phase? I mean, I appreciate we're, we're as uncertain as ever in terms of what we're going to be facing in what, six, eight weeks, whatever it is. Um, and obviously all of that is tough, but presumably we've been scenario planning around the major implications that we're going to have to deal with in some sort of shape or form. So as a resource committee, I wonder if you could share the work that's been done in terms of what that implementation resource could look like. Yeah, I mean, it is very much at planning stage because until it actually hits, we don't know exactly what we're going to need. Um, we have, as I said, had funding for regulatory service for, for services for the export health certificates, but we're honestly not quite sure what the demand is going to be. People may well be quite self-sufficient, businesses may well be able to manage quite well and be prepared and everything else. So as, as um, the Chief Executive mentioned earlier, these are just that risks that I've pointed out really, and they are um, also worst case scenario risks. Um, and it, it was really just to raise awareness of the type of things that may, um, may happen. But I don't think they're all going to happen on the 1st of January either. Mm. I think a lot of these will, uh, you know, will evolve as time goes on and as we're more aware of all the changes that need to take place. So the only thing that's going to change, I think, on the 1st of January is the likelihood of um, border controls in Europe when our um, businesses are trying to export to Europe. I think mm. from day one, that's going to be the immediate change. Mm. And businesses are trying to be prepared for that. So really, until, um, you know, until these things start evolving and we see what resources we, uh, we need, it's very difficult to, to plan for that at the moment. OK, thanks, Barbara. Thank you. OK, uh, right. Next up, okay. Joan Vaughan and then Redwin Jones. Joan, unmute yourself. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, no, um, Conway County, um, we only have tourism and agriculture. So I'm wondering, you know, when we're talking to Welsh Government, we have to emphasise those are our two industries, tourism and agriculture. And I'm just wondering, how do you think we will be affected by these European changes? Um, tourism, I don't think is going to be affected uh, at all, hardly. Uh, it may well be that um, uh, you might need a visa if you want to go to Estonia or somewhere in Europe. But really, I think generally, I don't think we'll notice any change at all in tourism. Um, 
Agriculture, yes, uh, there will be a change to agriculture because of the changes to the common agricultural policy and the funding that we've previously received from Europe. Um, the direct payment to farmers uh, will continue in some way, shape or form. Um, again, we're really not sure um, as to that at the moment, but the current um, uh, payments and uh, projects from the Common Agricultural Policy are continuing until 22, until, two, yeah. until 2022, because they're in the existing European programme, which we always have two years after the end of the programme in which to spend the money. So there is still going to be money um, available. Um, it's just that um, obviously at the end of that period, there will be a change. Yeah. But in that, in that process, we're hoping that the Welsh Government will have picked that up and the new funding stream, whatever that may be, will actually then fill the gap. Thank you very much, Barbara. Very informative. Thank you. Yeah, John. Right. Um, Thanks, Councillor Wynne Jones, and then go on with. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much again to Barbara for that presentation. And that's very clear under the circumstances. We're in a three crisis, really pandemic, Brexit, and we're being led by the most um, inept uh, government in, in the history of this country so it's difficult to make um, um, stuff out of this situation so I want to give an extra question here how much support can we give to businesses from I know the information you've got but do we have any financial phone line or for businesses who need support about uh, um, things that are coming in and out from Europe so there's some support there. I know that Ken's Gates have sent businesses um, information. There's a lot of information for Business Wales on their website to give support there. We also have a team in the business centre, where that's where they usually are, but also they're working with other grants at the moment, so they're very busy, but the information that they will give can help to focus and to refer people to the website, to Business Wales website, to try and help. But there are also other information out there. But I think um, most businesses would be able to use this information and try to make their own arrangements. But if not, we do have officers that will be able to help them, hopefully, um, by the 1st of January. Thank you, Barbara. Um, another question from the tourism perspective. Um, practically, I don't think there'll be a difference. Sorry, I'm losing win here. Um, the rest of Europe will see us as a xenophobic country. And the, sorry, I've lost. Yeah. I'll turn off the video. Is that better? Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Chair. Thanks for the answer, Barbara. For tourism, it's important to us. Is there a risk that um, Britain will see as a xenophobic country to the rest of Europe and people who are used to coming here will find that bring, coming to Europe is less, um, is less nice than in the previous years? Well, well I don't have an, an answer to that, unfortunately. But the only thing I can say is that we will be when we keep, we're doing all we can to promote Wales and accepting people from people from the whole world to come here and to attract them here. But sorry, I don't have a. I don't think I don't know how they think about the country right now. Thanks, Barbara. Thanks, Win. King Horrid, Gareth Jones, and then finally Harry Savile. Grunwy. 
Uh, I, I won't get political like Councillor Wayne and... Uh, Diolch, uh, this, this wasn't the decision of, uh, of the government. Obviously, this was a decision taken by the public to go out, come out of Europe. So they're following what the result of the vote was. Uh, and we are, we are, as far as farming and as a farmer, uh, farming have always changed, space change as far as European funding and as far as national funding. CAP reform was going on before the referendum in any case. And the, uh, at the end, the common agricultural policy uh, seemed imminent in any case. Um, farmers will adapt, as they always have done, and always have, will have to, to the circumstances uh, as they arise. But to ask uh, Barbara to be crystal ball gazing about whether people from Europe will see us as a centre point, because uh, it's a rather challenging question for anybody to answer. I don't think that will be the case. Britain and Wales is still a fantastic place to come on holiday. And as portfolio member for economic development tourism, I will certainly be pushing Wales as a <coughs> fantastic place to come on holiday uh, and I think uh, we have everything to look forward to as far as I'm concerned. Once we get over the the uh, political gerrymandering, I think Wales has a very really bright future depending on whoever leads us. Yeah, well, on am question, sir. Ah, good there was any question, so just a little answer there. So, Councillor Gareth Jones. Chair, thank you very much. Thank you for letting me speak. I want to thank Barbara very much for reminding us um, with that report there. It is difficult to make these reports and look into the future, so it's good that she spoke about COVID as well. So I think we're all focused on COVID during these last months. I know people that Barbara, of course, had to focus on Brexit and what it means. The only thing I want to ask is the problems and there's problem COVID about COVID and Brexit, shall we say. And what I want to say is our strategy. And I thank you, Anne, for what we have shared. We can't use much, but it's very important that we think about COVID and Brexit as one, because we, there's a threat to communities. And I think it would be bad to think about Brexit one and then COVID there. So thank you for talking about the pandemic and its context. And I think the strategy, the Kungor, the council, makes here is that we will look at the broad picture and think about everything which is which is also talking about threats and challenges it's not just brexit and covid but both together especially when we're talking about tourism as you've talked about we can't separate both things it's going to affect um, on both, one or the other. So that's the that's what I wanted to say there, that we do think about these things and these challenges, not as one problem, but everything together. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Gareth. Councillor Ronnie Hughes. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I've got a couple of points I want to pick up on the impacts on tourism. So first of all, shortly after the referendum, when the pound devalued, um, I, I seem to remember there was an up uptick in tourists coming to the UK because it became a more attractive tourist destination because they simply got, to put it bluntly, more bang for their buck. I just wondered whether or not there'd been any analysis to see whether or not that trend had continued. And the second question I've got, um, involving tourism is that some of the hotels in Flandern now have explained to me that their main concern about Brexit is around the labour market. At the moment, they're heavily reliant on immigrant labour. Uh, they feel that EU migrants do a better job than, um, than other people. Um, that's, that's simply their opinion. What I wanted to know is as part of the North Wales Growth Deal, I thought this council had committed to creating a tourism school or tourism academy locally. And I just wondered when was that likely to come online and how will that help to actually redress the balance so we can see more local people in local jobs? Thank you, Harry. Uh, Barbara? Gosh, that's another impossible question. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Good night, Dora. Do your best. Take the, the second, second part first, if I may. In terms of the growth deal, um, I know that members will be uh, reviewing that um, in the coming uh well, month or so now left, isn't it, uh, to, to agree that. Um, the growth deal, as you know, is, is just a means of funding, um, like any other means of funding, uh, and it is to deliver certain projects. And one of those projects is to look at um, tourism uh, within Conway. Now, how, how soon that will start um, once we hopefully receive approval from the two governments? Um, uh, I'm sorry, I have no answer to that one. But obviously, it is something that we do look at as, as um, very uh, strategically important for the region, uh, which is why it's actually in there. Um, and also, it's to look at tourism as a career, as opposed to something that people fall into because they can't find another job. Um, which uh, is what a lot of people uh, obviously have uh, possibly done in the past. Uh, in terms of the European labour within the hotels, um, obviously prior to COVID and the sort of hotel lockdowns, and I'm sure a lot of those people have now um, potentially um, either gone home, lost their, possibly even lost their jobs if they're not furloughed, um, then um, the EU settlement scheme, which is why this is so important to us, uh, is the EU, EU settlement scheme will allow those people to um, stay and continue to work in the UK. Um, the extension to that now is June 2021. They need to apply. It's a very simple application process, but we are trying to encourage everyone. And what we have done is we have notified um, all the, it, it's, it's equally important in the care sector as well. I may, I may add, I know that tourism was, was your question, um, but um, we have encouraged our um, care home providers and all our hoteliers um, to pass on information to their um, uh, European staff members to let them know about the settlement service and the uh, guidance that's available for them to uh, stay and apply to uh, continue to uh, live and work in Wales. Dear Barbara, um, I'm going to bring in Councillor uh, Sam Rowlands. Uh, he's got some clarification on the growth deal. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman, and, and good morning, everybody. Um, just on that specific question with regards to the Tourism Academy, um, that, that won't um, be completed uh, for, for a few years yet. Um, but there are other things that we can do um, aside from uh, the Academy itself. That's that's a you know a large capital scheme with, yes, a, um, a project um, linked to it with, with, within the tourism sector. Um, but, you know, there, there's other things that we, we could consider with the skills board and things like that, if there are gaps in, in some of those skills that we, we could look to support and, and plug. So um, perhaps that's something we should we should raise through through the skills board to see, you know, is there anything in the meantime we can do rather than waiting for a big new shiny building to be built? And um, there might be other things that we can do to support that sector in the meantime. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Sam. Um, Thank you, Harry. Sam. Harry? Are you happy? Are you happy? Yeah, reasonably. I mean, I, I, I welcomed what Sam said about looking at if it was a stopgap to help increase skills locally, if, if there was an impact from Brexit, that is that is useful. I, I just wondered, though, the original point I made about an uptick in tourism to the UK immediately after the referendum, has that, I mean, has that, obviously it would have been impacted by COVID, but COVID aside, have we seen that fall back? Sorry, I have no answer to that one. Uh, tourism is uh, is not my forte. Uh, that, I leave that to other officers, but I can certainly find out for you if, if you wish. Uh, I can uh, make inquiries of our uh, business support officers and find out. Okay. Can, can I just say, uh, for clarification, certainly the figures that we've had from the tourism survey is that tourism has very much been on the... So Grom is muted. Grom, it's he, he muted. Sorry, Sorry. Uh, certainly looking at the figures from the tourism surveys we've had, there's been a growth in tourism year on year now, and it hopefully will continue when we come out of this COVID period. The trend is certainly that Wales is doing extremely well. Yeah, okay, Harry, are you happy Thank you with very that? Much. For now. Thank you, Harry. Right, finally. Okay, finally, Councillor Ronnie Hughes. Good morning, sir. Thank you, Chair. Can I just get a point of clarification of Barbara before I say anything? 
Barbara, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Barbara, can you just clarify now? You said the ex it's going to be two years for the extension for the rural funding. Would that mean that if there's any tariff put on land, would that come in in January or would they have to wait for two years? Uh, no, the tariffs will happen from January. It's just the funding that's already in the in the common agricultural policy and in the rural development program that's safe until 2022. But the tariffs will come in from January. The tariffs could be quite substantial on land. That's the last one I heard from Europe. It could be, and it's it, and it's going to have an effect dramatically in Conway on, on the rural area. No doubt about it. And if we can just go back to the to what we've been discussing today, the deprivation figures for Conway is 70% of GDP. The new funding that is going to come from central government is going to include the 22 authorities. And I'll say to all the committee members, that is wrong. There were only 13 or 15 authorities that were drawing down the European money. It should go on a formula base. And this council should be putting more pressure onto the Welsh Assembly and onto central government, because I know Sam has got a, key, they've got a key in the door there, to start saying, we want a good share. And what worries me is again now, is that we're looking at the GDP of 70%. And the reason why it's never gone up, and that's through me as well, or in the past, we rely a lot on tourism, and we have an opportunity here to rely on tourism, but digress, but move over to something else with new ideas. You know, when when you have something like this that's going on now, you need ideas on the shelf. You need councillors to sit down and say, "This is what we want to spend the capital program on." We've got these ideas. It's no use saying, "Oh, we want sixty million, but we don't know what we're going to spend it on." We've got to back ourselves up to say how we're going to spend it and how we're going to go about it. You know, there's going to be a double whammy here with Brexit and with what's gone on with the, with the plague. We're going to cop it really hard in Conway. I, I'm convinced of that. But the council itself, and I can't propose anything because I'm no longer on the committee, but the council itself put, put, should have put a notice of motion in saying that the, we should have the fair share of the funding. I cannot, for the life of me, see what... I know Flint and Wrexham, their GDP is 120. How they can justify taking away money from us and putting it into Wrexham and Flint, I just can't see, see that being fair. I've, this authority has been badly done to before, and I don't think we should be badly done to for the future. You know, I think the council should put a notice of motion in saying that we want a, 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 a formula-based issue. And just on the final points that Gromwe made, Biden's only concern is, is losing the Irish agreement. That's what the concern's coming from. from thing. He, if that Irish agreement is broken, because they're going to be, they're going to be um, taken to court about it, if that's broken, all hell's going to break loose. But I honestly think councillors sitting on this committee today should make a resolution to see that Conway gets a fair deal. Thank you, Ronnie. Um, I don't think you can come back on that, can you, Barbara? Uh, no, no, but I'd like to see the members of the committee coming back. All right. Okay, then. Does anybody want to come back on what Ronnie Hughes has said quickly? Yes, Chair. Yeah, go on, John. What, Ronnie, are you wanting a proposal from this committee to, to do what? So the, the, the new funding is going to come from central government at some stage. They've promised, they've promised that this funding will come to, to, um, to, to Wales. We should be getting, as the same formula when we had it from the yeah. EU, it should be coming to Conway. Not going to the other. What falls into this trap is 
Re Cardiff and Swansea come into the equation, not Swansea, Cardiff. So if Cardiff comes in, we will get absolutely nothing. So and if, you you, want... and if, you, if we can't see that, we can't see nothing. Right. So you want you want us to put forward to the WLGA, to Welsh Government, that we retain the original EU formula for West Wales. I, I yeah, and I don't do, look. It's not just the Welsh Assembly issue. This, this is central government. Central governments have a, a major role to play with this. And okay. there's been an argument who's going to distribute the money, central government or the Welsh Assembly. You know, pick, take your choice. But I feel that we should be putting a case forward to say, hey, you can't do, take it away from us after you promised that we, it would be no difference. Right. I'm, I'm unsure of the wording you want this committee. Can you can't I, put that down. <laughs> all right. Well, can I propose that this committee makes representation that the formula for the funding stays the same as it was under the EU rules? Yeah. Okay. okay. Right. Before I'll do that. I before I ask for a second or two, Joan's proposer, I want to bring in um, uh, Councillor Sam Rowlands. Thanks, Mr Chairman. Um, I just wonder whether what we should be saying is, or what the committee you should be saying is, is something more in line with that Conway should do no worse and should only do better than in previous. Because hmm. the, the formula, um, yeah, be, I think it would be quite hard to expect a formula to remain exactly the same. Um, I just wonder whether I, I completely agree with, with Ronnie's sentiment here. So please hear me correctly. Um, that the sentiment completely agree with in terms of the detail of what sh what we should be proposing. Um, I, I wonder whether we just should. I'm I'm, I'm comfortable, you know, as, as Ronnie suggested, something goes into full council as some sort of resolution as a statement. Um, I'm a bit concerned about um, trying to put something together now. Um, I wonder whether um, it's obviously it's your scrutiny committee. Do whatever you want. Um, but it, by saying the formula remains the same, um, that might restrict things. There might because there might be something better. That's the issue. We might be able to do better than than staying the same. Appreciate Ronnie's concerns. We don't want things to get worse. Happy to make that statement. We don't want things to get worse, but there could be an even better solution for us. Right. I will amend the proposal to say that we should not be worse off. Okay. Does that make any any yeah. sense? That's that's fine. Uh, is there a second for Joan's proposal? I can see Andrew Hinchcliffe has got his hand up. Andrew? Ooh. Yes, I, I second that. Uh, I, I think we will be worse off if we're not careful. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Quickly now, I'm going to go back to Ronnie. Are you happy with that, Ronnie? I'm happy with that, but I, I also want to say... I did say quickly. Yeah, we have to keep an eye on this tariff on the rural area. Okay. If it comes, we've got to be prepared. Uh, all right. right. Right, back to Joan. Make your proposal, Joan. Um, that this committee puts to full council the proposal that for European funding, Conway is not worse off than it was before. Yeah, thank you. I've got a seconder for that. Right, I've got Anne McCaffrey and Chris Hughes. Now, I will allow you to speak, but quickly, okay? So, Anne McCaffrey, quick, Just please. Of, thanks, Chair. Point of clarification. Obviously, European funding won't exist anymore, so I think we have to be a bit tighter in our wording here. I presume what Ronnie is referring to is the UK, UK Prosperity Fund, um, so I think we need to be clear about articulating that. And equally, who is this to? Because patently, the UK Prosperity Fund is a UK government thing. So I think we just need to be clear what it is we're asking and who we're asking of it, really. OK, thank you. Um, and Chris, quickly. Thanks, Jen. My, my point was on a similar point to Councillor Anne's. It was about, I think... It, rather than European funding, it needs to refer to both Europe, both UK and Welsh government funding designed to support uh, economic growth. Okay, thank you. Did you hear that, Joan? Yes. 
Right. Yes. Can you... I'm happy right. to include all that. Okay. I'm sure somebody will put the words together. All right. <laughs> Fine. Okay, then. So we've got that proposal and the second. Um, before that, though, I am conscious of the fact that we need a proposal and a seconder for the report. Nigel Smith, thank you. Have we got a seconder? Joan will second that, thank you. Um, with, with that one, um, I can ask for a, um, a, a show of hands for that one. Okay, thank you. Right, um, over to you, Dawn. Uh, Sally, right, Sally? Uh, okay, so we need to uh, take a vote on Joan's uh, proposal. Which yeah, can can can, can you can you clarify the proposal, I, please, yes, Sally? I'll as try you... my best. Yes. Yeah, come on. Okay, so the proposal was that this committee puts forward to full council uh, that, in relation to the UK Prosperity Fund and also funding from Welsh government, uh, that Conway uh, Council is not worse off than previously. Yeah, everybody happy with that? I can see a lot of nodding dogs, so I <laughs> presume that you are happy. Uh, Ewan Davis has got his hand up. I'll, I'll quickly let him come in. Um, <clears throat> would you mind if we um, try and finesse that, that, that word yes. in coming to council? Yeah? yeah. So we would yeah. certainly get the, the principle you're trying to achieve. But we'll, we'll work on a... a, a a, a clearer motion, if that's okay, Joe. Okay, well, that's Ron, fine, Ron, fine. Ronnie seem, is nodding his head, so he seems to be happy. Okay, yeah, and Sally, I'm lying after you. Okay, yeah, so I'll, I'll read the names out. So, for, against, or abstain. So, Councillor Phil Kappa. For. Councillor Jeff Corrie. For. Councillor Brian Cossey. For. Councillor Pauline Heap Williams. For. Councillor Andrew Hinchliffe. For. Councillor Chris Hughes. Or Councillor Wynne Ellis Jones. Applied. Councillor Peter Lewis. Or Councillor Yvonne Lloyd. Applied. Or Councillor Anne McCaffrey. Or Councillor Dave Rees. Or Councillor Austin Roberts. Applied. Or Councillor Harry Savile. Or Councillor Nigel Smith. Applied. Or Councillor Joan Vaughan. Or Councillor Andrew Wood. Or and Councillor Aaron Wynn. Obliged. Four. Yeah, that's very chair. Yeah, diolch yn mori iawn chi. Reid o'r diwedd, gwn i symud. Thank you very much. We can move on finally to the 12th item, which is the health and safety report. And it's been presenting by Richard Evans. Hello, thank you very much um, for having me here today. Um, this is the annual report that I have for you um, uh, for the 1920 um, year, and the analysis goes from the 1st of April uh, 2019 to the 31st of March 2020. Um, also to say that this is obviously an, an annual report, so we've got um, previous reports that it refers back to, and this is a, a continuum of that. So if I may, um, I'll go through the, the, the summary points. Um, I've also got a very short presentation here of a six monthly update, so I thought that'd be valid um, given the circumstance we were in. Um, and um, I'll, I'll continue on, on, on that basis if that's okay. Um, so in the 1920, we had um, four enforcement notices across the authority, which was an increase of four on the previous year. We had 1,163 accidents which were reported. Um, of these, and um, as I said, we, we, we have a, a county-wide system that we record a lot of accidents. So we look for trend analysis and instances and emerging issues. The uh, 30 of those were reported to the health and safety uh, executive um, under the reporting of injuries, diseases, and dangerous occurrences regulations. And they are of, of, of the more serious. Um, of those instances that we had as well, we had um, well, we had 33 of those instances to provide a high-level investigation, which means that corporate health and safety took the lead in these, and uh, 90 required at a medium level, which were predominantly led by the, the services, but with the corporate health and safety guidance um, on top of that. Um, 40 of these accidents, uh, incidents, sorry, involved employees who were incapacitated 
due to a workplace accident uh, and tragically um, sick due to the, the injuries um, or occurrences that they have. Um, corporate Health and Safety conducted 54 audits in that period and our site self uh, assessment audit was completed in the January, February of last year, 1920, over 141 sites. Um, we used the system called CAMS, which is the, um, or the um, corporate um, management system that, that we have and over the years. We've built in um, two systems that are live at the moment and one that we're working on. The two that are live are the incident management system and the, and the audit management system. And we have those because, um, uh, again, it's a, a consistent way to, to record our information that enables all those line managers and others um, real-time information and that we can work through that. Um, we obviously um, work across the board, education and uh, across. So one of the highlight ones there at 1.7 is that um, inconsistencies have been uh, identified. Within the, within the school sector, uh, staff not consistently attending uh, training or corporate uh, development. Um, we've had a project running for a couple of years on the management of contractors, which has uh, brought up our compliance among our contractors, ensuring that they are all registered to an accredited scheme. And we've been working with, um, this one's pre-COVID, um, with the case social care to, pro to pro providers as well, to um, uh, raise their standards in the, the, the care homes there. There's uh, a lot of detail in the report um, and uh, that you, you can see and I'll obviously take questions on afterwards. Um, I'd like to just run through the recommendations if that's all right and then move on to the half yearly overview that we can um, have a quick look at as well. Um, so the recommendation one was the uh, 2.1 there, that the education service, the IDC and ICC resolve the issues regarding CAMS audit for schools. This has been progressed um, and um, business managers and the majority of schools now have have access to them. There are some areas where our, our, our systems and IT systems differ slightly, um, particularly in, in, in the foundation schools where they're not using our infrastructure and uh, a couple of uh, secondary schools. The CAMS uh, software is further rolled out to service managers uh, without access uh, to, uh, to have access to ensure that they have site and ownership of their sections, outstanding actions, enable them to look at their specific dashboard reports. Um, again, this hasn't been rolled out entirely to, to the managers across the authority. And um, that the um, cor corporate health and safety um, um, resumes the protection employees board um, and the service manager report monitors actually will reduce the accidents and violence and aggression. Um, the protection of the employees board um, is uh, cross department, cross service areas that particularly look at violence and aggression um, in, in, in the workplace and uh, emerging instances. And the 2.4 there that services manager the working practices of employees of multiple incidences and put in measures to prevent reoccurrence. Um, so they're the, 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 the main recommendations for the report. Um, if I may, can I um, present my screen and give you a, a six monthly update? Yes, you may by all means, yeah. Thank you. Is this available for people to see now? Yes. Y yes, I can see it, yeah. Okay, so um, this, this, this report um, dated then, um, 1st of April 2020 to the 30th of September 2020 as an update. Obviously, it's been some changing times here. Um, we've had no enforcement notices um, uh, this period. Um, the accidents, as you can see there, have, have come down uh, dramatically and, and obviously um, with our periods of school shortage and also leisure industries that accounted for that. 
Our audits that we've completed um, have gone up um, up to 153. Um, 149 of these were COVID visits in preparation for our sites to be opening up. We've worked extremely well with our colleagues in education and across the piece there to ensure that we've got consistent standards to the reopening of our uh, our, our areas and in, in particular to the schools. Um, and that round was, was obviously completed in the first um, catch up um, sessions and also again then in September. Our investigations are down, um, uh, as you can see there, as are the days in capacity to a worker and read all reports and our training courses, which are down as, go, uh, as well. And the delegates that we have had also on our training courses are down. Um, again, of course, face-to-face um, -face training had to stop immediately um, on, 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 on the time of COVID. Um, oh, sorry. Um, so just another little shed there. So instances involving employees um, were, were down. Um, instances involving members of the public were down and also pupils were down. Um, the only one that was going up there was the instance involving social care clients, and that had kind of gone up in that six monthly um, picture as well. Um, again, maybe resulted to to, to the COVID. Um, uh, an overview then of of, of what we've done. Um, we produced the genetic risk assessments, guidance, and procedures throughout the COVID nineteen. We've reviewed, commented, and advised on all the opening risk assessments at least twice of those. Um, we've visited schools as a priority, and all have had at least one visit. All our site risk assessments, including multi occupancy sites visits to a priority, and they've all had at least one. At the time of writing the report, there was twenty three pending. I think there's eight pending now. Um, CHS, Corporate Health and Safety, also review every risk assessment where two metre social distancing cannot be maintained to ensure there's correct procedures in place there. They are working across the organisation in the various um, renewal boards, work-wise projects and boards. We have also provided support to the third sector and providers with our guidance, sharing what we have built up and sharing our good practice. And we have also visited um, some of our um, providers there, um, people like Crest, people like Livability and Ventura to ensure that we can manage and get our um, vulnerable clients back to some sort of stability because that, 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 that's extremely important. Um, we've developed and maintained our procedures and guidance, um, sometimes on a daily or twice daily basis. As you know, the guidance changes so frequently. Um, corporate health and safety itself has had no um, sickness absence over the period and we've put in over 200 hours of um, overtime specifically related to COVID um, and, and that's five officers um, within my unit there and we've also had the ongoing work with civil contingencies that we, we work collaboratively with the North Wales Local Resilience Forum and I'm currently working with them on second evacu uh, evacuation shelter and learning and development programs as we speak. There is a, um, uh, a North Wales um, scenario testing towards the end of the month. And uh, obviously the weather over the weekend has also tested us as well. Um, that I think um, is my overview and I'm very happy to take any questions um, if you have them. Yeah. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you very much. Um, one, two, three, four, five hands up. I'll start with uh, Julie Fallon and then the Chief Executive and Davis. Julie. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to come in really and highlight my thanks in terms of the support that Richard and his team have provided to education. Uh, and to schools, I mean, it's been massive in terms of giving schools the confidence, especially that first time to reopen uh, with the support, with the risk assessments, um, having having the staff come in and walk through the risk assessments with head teachers and staff in the school. Uh, really, I you know, I, I struggle to think of anything that 
has had more of an impact actually over the last few months in terms of our schools uh, than the support that's been provided here um, to give them the confidence to open and, and that sort of security in, in the health and safety arrangements. So um, I, I just really wanted to say uh, thank you so much. I know it's um, obviously increased demand massively on your uh, on your team. Um, and yeah, it, it, it just has been uh, really powerful and uh, very well appreciated by, by schools and by uh, us as a cabinet and um, education services. So thanks, Richard. Yeah, Julie. Uh, you, very much. you and Davis? Uh, along similar lines, I, I'm, I'm glad that uh, Richard pinched the, the opportunity to report on last year's uh, 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 report by, by giving us an update on, on the past six months, because um, I think that's the, probably the, the most significant um, uh, thing in front of you today. And similarly, uh, I'd like to thank, thank uh, Richard and his team for what they've done uh, beyond education. I mean, they, they've been working with all our services. Uh, to um, try and help uh, a, a safe return to to work where work had, had been in, in those relatively small number of places where work had been um, suspended. So yeah, just a word, word of thanks and appreciation. Um, and as you say, the, the, the 200 hours of overtime have been really well earned. Thanks. Thank you. Can I also say on part of everyone. Thank Richard there for his presentation today and also thanks to his staff for all his work, their work. Okay, Councillor Peter Lewis and then Nigel Smith. Th th thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you, Richard. Uh, I think uh, <coughs> the one thing that we can get in fr from this report that if you look at the uh, five-year figure, it's the number of incidents that is actually going down. And I think that's a reflection of you and your uh, service in terms of the culture that you've built with, within uh, Conway. I've got one question, but I'd also like to uh, uh, propose all the recommendations as listed uh, uh, under, under two, two there. Thank but, you, Peter. Uh, in terms of um, the six month update you gave us, I think it's encouraging uh, the way the figures are going. But in terms of the um, uh, total accidents, I just wondered whether or not there was any particular service which had uh, shown a significant uh, improvement or whether it was across the board. Thank you. Richard? Um, I think um, generally um, the headline figures of the accidents and instances are 1,100 plus. Um, is, is, is a fluctuating figure, and it, and it sometimes depends on the activities that we, we end up doing. Um, I think that the, the figure really that we, we, we concentrate more is on the, the Vidor reports, those, those more serious ones. Obviously, the, the, the times we have to report uh, ourselves to the, the health and safety executive, and also particularly for me, those, the, those areas where people are getting harmed um, being in work, doing what they come to do. Um, I repeat it quite so a, a, a lot and it is getting through, um, but nobody comes to work to be hurt physically or mentally by the, by, by the job they do. So they're the ones that I particularly have focus on. Um, I'm, I'm very pleased and thankful that um, we, we, we get recognised. I think that it's been an absolute pleasure to, to, to work with our service managers, section managers, heads of service and all during this very, very difficult time. Um, and it's been a pleasure because we've had the foundations. We've, we've, we've got very good foundations. Um, it is slightly disappointing when we spend a lot of time, resources, money, expertise, and technical ability to build systems for people to use, and they don't get quite rolled out, um, which is why for the second year, we're asking again that all managers have access to these systems. It is also prudent in these times as well. It stops paper getting shifted. It stops duplication of resources and it enables people to have that real-time information in front of them so that service managers and section managers can actually focus and, and, and go a little bit more granular than we can do um, to look at those trends um, that, that they were having. Um, emerging issues at the moment is around violence and aggression. Um, the figures that I have in at the moment are 
probably the same as, as, as last year, but we, have, we, we haven't been operating services to the level. Um, so we're, we're, we're asking and encouraging people to, to, to obviously report those through so we can, we can look at any trend analysis. And it might also be a reflective, and it probably is, isn't it, of, of the stress that everyone's been under and, and, and the difficult circumstances that we're, we're, we're working within. Yeah, and Peter, are you happy with that? Uh, yes, I, I just, uh, it, my question was relating to the six month figure. I just wondered really as to whether or not uh, the fact that uh, people working at home has had a, a significant effect in terms of, of those figures, really. Thank you. Um, they, they, they might have people probably won't be as, as, as um, immediate in reporting an accident if they fall over at home as they were doing in, in, in Koi Pesla. Um, we've also got um, a stellar system that, again, um, you know, the foundations are good. We've got a bilingual online um, display screen equipment, your DSE. So looking after people's musculoskeletal um, requirements at home. We've had this system in place for a number of years now. and It's not just a, a question and answer. It's um, an online um, training and assessment tool and management system so that if people require kit or it's identified that they can't um, set up in a way that's going to prevent musculoskeletal disorders then that's a management system again that we've got embedded um, and I do believe that we're, we're, we're probably the only one in North Wales with something like that so again you know good work um, good solid work that, 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 that we can we, we can ensure that we, we rise from as well um, and I think that's um, you know, one of the areas we, we will have to concentrate on moving forward is around the many issues associated with home working. I, I don't think it's for everyone. I think, you know, particularly, you know, I don't know, we're of an age, aren't we? Um, I was very lucky to buy a house years and years ago that is, is of a size. And, and my heart breaks for those people who may be um, young families, small houses, um, children at home. It's not as easy for everybody else. And I think that as we move forward, when we're saying what, what are our, our office accommodation looking like and what is our community support looking like and how they're doing anything, I think we can embrace COVID and I think we can, we can use it to concentrate um, and, um, resources in the community. And I think we can make our resources available to those who need them. Thank you, Richard. Are you happy now, uh, Peter? The Ochwauer Peter. Right, Nigel Smith, I take it you're going to second Peter's proposal? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Chair. I'd like to do that. Uh, I'd also like to congratulate uh, the Cabinet member, Emma, uh, Richard and his team for an excellent report, uh, a transparent report that highlights the good work that they do on behalf of us uh, to um, maintain our properties in it as a safe environment for our valuable staff. I have one small question though. I notice on page 92, 3.6, uh, it mentions uh, three sites reported as needing improvement and one of them was uh, Coed Petler. And my question to Richard is, on the state of the art brand new building that's just celebrated its, uh, I don't know, just come past its 12, 12, 12 month birthday. What were the improvements that were needed? Um, but, but, um, excuse me, but with, without without going into the detail of the report, I won't be able to um, um, pull that out of my mind at the moment. Um, it, it, it would have been things. Um, the, 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 there are some um, real nuances. I think things like access and address, and particularly around um, those people who who, who may be um, visually impaired. Um, there were some areas around that. I think there, there was areas. That, um, um, to be honest, I'd rather not speculate. <laughs> Um, but, if, uh, but again, the, 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 this detail is, is, is available at service, um, and I said this is a highlight report, um, and, and those services do have those reports, or the, the self-assessment is reported by those services. Um, they then go into this with the CAM system, so they have actions sitting against us. Um, so 
they are well aware of, of, of what they need to do, but they are, that is, the, the, the scrutiny as well can be, can be more of that detail. Uh, apologies, I can't give you a more fuller answer. I can come back to you at another time. It's okay. Thank you very much anyway. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. Right. I've got a proposal and I've got a seconder, but I also got Councillor Emma Leighton Jones who's been waiting patiently and she is the portfolio holder. And then after Emma, I've got Councillor Harry Saville and then Councillor Anne McCaffrey and then we will go to the vote. So Councillor Emma Leighton, Skolachira. Thank you, I really appreciate it. Um, I just want to say how important this report is for all members um, in the fact that it highlights that consistent and robust approach we have to health and safety uh, across the authority and, it, and it's vital that we understand that so it's really good um, to see some questions being asked. Um, also I, I just want to take the opportunity to thank Richard and the team um, as you've guessed by that six monthly update they've worked their socks off um, under a huge amount of pressure um, to ensure that as a authority um, we adhere to that appropriate um, legislative requirements and they're providing the leadership that's needed and the expertise that's vital um, so I want to thank them for the work that they've done and once more um, thank you Kadeira for giving me the opportunity. Thanks to you. Question? Yeah I have. Um, on page 98 we've got paragraph 1.3 and forgive me if this was touched on in the presentation, but says all managers routinely have access to CAMS directly, apart from ERF and schools. Now, I would have thought ERF and schools would perhaps be the two services where we'd expect the highest number of incidents to be logged from or accidents to occur. So I, I just wondered why managers and those two services didn't have direct access. And it goes on to say that corporate health and safety support managers with data inputs with recording instance. I mean, does that not take up more time than just letting these services do it themselves? Richard? Um, yes, um, that, that's, that's the recommendation in the report that all services have um, direct access so their line managers can look at their staff, their areas. Um, nuances do exist. Um, <laughs> I certainly know the, the, some of the reasons within schools um, was the, the, the IT access um, that, that, that we've, we've certainly smoothed out for incidents and, and, and accidents. Um, accidents. Um, and there was a, an issue with our, our network in the, um, the schools because they have a school network in the, in the secondary schools. But um, we're, we're certainly ironing those out. And I know Wynn and his team as, as, as work diligently there as, as, as well. Um, I, I think it's, um, as I said, yes, we, we, we support these systems. We, we, we've got training programs on, on our, on our website. We've got lots of um, uh, training videos on, on for, for, for um, managers to, to, to gain access and to use it. Um, and I think it just needs further rolling out. And again, you know, I think it's a theme, corporate systems are corporate. Um, and, and, and the more we use it, the more we use it. Um, and people will get used to using it. People will, will, will have that. And I think in, in the, the more remote way we're working, these sorts of advances in technology um, are more and more important to, as you said, reducing resources and certainly reducing resources on my team. Um, to provide reports because they're all there and the, the, the timely um, um, uh, analysis and, and reports are there. We could, we could go straight on to the instant database now and you would see anything that came in this morning or, or, or on, so they, they are live. Um, yeah, so um, that's why the recommendations in the report. So we do get everyone, um, uh, again, SLT's agreed where it's been there, that everyone gets on the system who needs to be on it. Okay, Harry, are you happy? Yeah? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Oh, lovely, thank you. Finally, your question, please, Anne. I haven't got a question, Chair, but I've got some comments and indeed a bit of an amendment to the proposal that we, we've got in the report. I mean, everybody, uh, including myself, would congratulate Richard and the team on a comprehensive report. It's clear and it's really well presented. 
And really evidence is for me the progress that this small team continues to make and the vital part that they've played um, over the last five years, particularly and more recently within the COVID scenario. From my own experience as being a chair of governors, they turned up whenever they said they would, they're just in time and their advice was constructive, reassuring and realistic. So Julie's comments are, are spot on. So well done team. However, if we just focus on 2019 and 20, which is what the report um, in actual before us is about, some of the issues identified are deja vu, they are recurring and many are legal compliance issues. And I do hear um, Richard's underlying sort of frustration and plea because, you know, his team, he and his team with others have worked very hard to lay the foundations here. Systems, training programs, all of the infrastructure that helps us really, as, as Emma's related to a robust health and safety culture um, and infrastructure. But, you know, patently there, are, there is room for improvement and I know the first six months he's just articulated has shown some improvement, which is to be welcomed. But when it comes to the recommendations, you know, he talks about that the health and safety leadership team accepts and supports the recommendations. I would like to just insert there um, a piece that it's about SLT and heads of service really um, reinforcing their management responsibilities in this key area, because I think Richard and his team have built the tools and the step change now that we need is just this compliance culture. Um, so I would just like to add that little piece to those recommendations to support Richard um, to move further forward um, than he currently is. And he's done a really grand job thus far. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you, Anne. What I was trying to say before I forgot to unmute myself was, Peter, are you happy to accept those amendments? Uh, I just wonder how different these are from previous ones. And perhaps uh, I'd uh, like uh, perhaps some uh, guidance as to from Yuan Davis, if he's happy for that before I agree to it. Okay, Yuan. Um, I think with uh, all sorts of corporate, uh, when we say corporate, uh, they're, they're, they're sort of all embracing issues. It's always difficult to get 100% compliance, but um, I assure you that they're, they're, I, think, I think Richard has, has alluded to this. We have the right culture in place. So there's, where, there's, where there are lapses in compliance is not through sort of willful disregard. It's, it's typically through uh, other pressures uh, or other, other issues taking to, uh, coming to the fore, um, but I'm, I'm happy to accept um, a, a, a responsibility on senior officers to uh, comply with their health and safety requirements, certainly. So you're um, happy with, with Anne's amendments? Yes, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. Peter? Yes, fine. I, I wasn't being pedantic. I was just uh, aware, having been vice chair of this committee, Yes. I know what work's been done in the past and whatever, and the, I know there's a, management take it seriously. There's a lot of things I could accuse you of, uh, Peter, but I don't think pedantic is one of them. Uh, right, uh, Councillor Dave Rees, as Vice Chair, I am going to allow you to speak, and then we shall take the amended vote. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Richard, thank you very much for a very comprehensive report, but I just wanted to have clarity on one particular item, please. <clears throat> Did you mention in your report that ERF are not quite on board with CAMS at the moment? Correct. Correct. Yes. I mean, you brought this item to this committee last year. Uh, we're 12 months on there uh, again, and, and this has still not happened. Um, okay, that's quite interesting. I just want to make that admit make that clear to all members. There is one principal part of the council where quite a lot of accidents occur, uh, quite serious accidents because many of the jobs in the ERF are of a manual nature. So I think it needs highlighting that we need to move on here in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dave. That, that's a very good and relevant point. I think this um, applies to schools as well, Chair, in fairness. Yes. Okay. Right then. Um, 
Richard, do you want to come back? Um, just to thank you all very, very much. Um, and I've obviously relied on the comments that everyone's made back to my team as well. And just to confirm as well, you know, it's not a stop. Um, I, I said at FLT, um, we'll keep going and we, we, we will we'll all get through this um, by maintaining these gun standards. We'll be, we'll be fine. We'll get through it. Thank you, Richard. Right, I'm going to go on. To, um, before I go on, I just want to check with Councillor Nigel Smith, who seconded Peter Lewis. Are you happy to second the amendments as well, Peter? Uh, Nigel. Yes, I am, Jack. Thank you, Nigel. Uh, right, we'll go on to the vote. Sally. Uh, yep, yeah, okay, so I'll read out the names. So, Councillor Phil Capper. For. Oh. Councillor Jeff Corrie. Or oh. Councillor Brian Cossey. Or oh. Councillor Pauline Heap Williams. Or oh. Councillor Andrew Hinchliffe. Or oh. Councillor Chris Hughes. Or oh. Councillor Wynne Ellis Jones. Applied. Oh. Councillor Peter Lewis. Or oh. Councillor Ivod Lloyd. Councillor Ivod still here? No, I don't think so. Okay, Councillor Anne McCaffrey. Four. Councillor Dave Rees. Four. Councillor Austin Roberts. Oblied. Four. Harry Saville. Four. Councillor Nigel Smith. Four. Councillor Joan Vaughan. Four. Councillor Andrew Wood. Four. And Councillor Adam Wynn. Oblied. Yeah, that's Four. carried, Chair. Oh, no, no, ideal, diolch. Yep, that's carried, Chair. Yeah, diolch and well, Sally. Um, right. Thank you, Sally. Right, moving on to the item 12, 13, sorry. To the assess the budgetary position, Andrew Kirkham is going to present. Are you still with us? Certainly am, Chair. Thank you. Well, I'm glad you are. <laughs> right. Uh, oh, here we go. Dawn is going to put the report on the screen so we can go through it together. Uh, <clears throat> we'll start on uh, paragraph 3.1, which is the details, please. Thank you. Um, so this is the second uh, published budget report in respect of 2021. Um, the previous one was on the 21st of September and that followed two informal presentations in June and August. Paragraph 3.2 refers to the uh, hope of producing a recovery plan and a, a more comprehensive report. Um, we not quite managed to do that, um, mainly because of the pace of problems that have arisen over the past 50 day days or so in terms of addressing other very pressing issues. Um, and it's quite interesting, isn't it, that the last report was ri written on the 7th of September. This was written on the 20th of October. And in those 43 days, so much has happened. We've moved from a position of potentially containing the pandemic to uh, one that, that, that is showing that we're certainly not there at this point in time. And, and, and I guess um, our offices, our services have been responding to uh, those pressures over the past two months. So things that we may have wished to do, uh, unfortunately, we've not been able to do as completely as possible and, and this report reflects that to a large extent. Um, we're still uh, working on the same premise as last time, i.e. addressing uh, the important issues in respect of our financial position. And table one, um, just after paragraph 3.8, reflects one of those. Uh, we've, we've made claims for additional expenditure and lost income uh, for £10 million. 
and um, at this point in time, we received grant support of nine and a half million. And I, and I think that members will agree with me that that's been, you know, time well spent to secure, to identify that, that expenditure, to identify the income we've lost and to pretty well successfully uh, manage to put in claims and get it refunded. The, the latest claim for expenditure, 520,000, uh, was only made on the 15th of October. So that's why that's nil at the moment, Welsh Government is still assessing it. So, um, as I say, time uh, well spent in terms of what the services and finance department have been have been doing in respect of our overall uh, financial financial position. Paragraph three point ten does point out that this process is I've called it uh, resource hungry, um, but it, come back to it, it, it's time well spent. We, we have in the past talked about. Uh, grants being distributed by formula to save, if you like, the red tape of completing claims. But I'm, I must say that a formula wouldn't have delivered the, the, the support we need or have needed so far. Um, so I, I come back to it. Yes, uh, resource hungry, but uh, time uh, well spent to secure that funding for Conway. Moving on, you can see, as I say, the expenditure that we've claimed and, and with the grant we've got and, and, and the income. Um, a lot of the expenditure relates to paragraph 3.11 uh, points out, uh, social care uh, and other areas. We've not had everything <clears throat> back that we've claimed, but I come back to it. We've been um, relatively successful in terms of what we have put together in terms of lost income. Um, Again, we, we were successful in claiming what we'd lost um, in what they call tranche one. And the tranche two, in other words, everything other than the venue, car parking, tramway, west collection, et cetera, um, successful in, in our first quarter claim for that lost income. We, we are compiling the second quarter claim as we speak, and, and that's due to go to Welsh Government um, in early November, I think it's the 10th, and we'll have to wait and see uh, how we go on there. In terms of fur furlough, um, we've, we've claimed grant in the sum of, um, well, when writing this report, just over a million pounds. The September claim, in, claim went in uh, for 120 just after this report was written. Uh, and again, you know, so things are so fast moving at the time of writing, the furlough grant was to end. Sorry, the furlough arrangement was to end at the end of October, but of course, as from Saturday, the the the, the furlough process will will be extended. I think it's till uh, the end of December, as things stand. So we'll be carrying on with that for the for the next few months. And as an aside, that grant that we've claimed from the UK government uh, reduces our claim to the Welsh government. So we are helping Wales in terms of what we tried to. Do with regard to the furlough arrangements. We, we can see from table one that already we are, um, if you like, overspent by 263,000 on the expenditure and 139 on the income. And, and that forms part of uh, the table later on that we'll come to very shortly. So what we've tried to do is update the overall position reported last time or the assessed position which showed us 4.3 million in inverted commas overspent. Um, between then and now things have improved uh, financially and we're now picking up for that table the things that have changed, the things we've had time to review and how it's affected our overall position. So 3.16 refers to, you may recall, the budget reductions were presented to you. Um, we felt, we thought at that time we'd be 1.5 million um, unachieved, if you like, in terms of our planned budget reductions. Social services have looked very carefully at theirs and, and, and they've clawed back half a million pounds of that. So one of the elements of the overall overspend previously reported has now been reduced by half a million pounds. Other services are still 
going through theirs, looking at theirs, see what other options there are. But I, I come back to it, we've not been able to complete that uh, task at this point in time. So therefore, we, we, we're carrying forward uh, just under just over a million pounds uh, into the into the financial assessment table. If we move on to council tax reduction, still high on the Welsh government's agenda in terms of providing support for the council tax reduction that we um, apply to those who are who are eligible. Um, there's not been a second quarter claimed yet. Um, so at the moment, we're still hopeful that whatever we incur over and above our budget or in inverted commas in a normal year will be funded by Welsh Government. Um, it could equate to a million pounds. We'll have to wait and see what it does. And obviously, we'll have to wait and see whether Welsh Government do indeed continue with their with their 100% support that they gave um, a quarter one for the rest of the year. The, la the last report um, in September picked up on the pay awards that had just been agreed at that point in time. And the report actually said that we need to do a bit more work on the cost, the estimated cost of the pay awards. Uh, again, that's something we, we have managed to do. And um, two, two things have happened. The first thing is, uh, the Welsh Government have now confirmed they will support part of the uh, Teachers' Pay Award by way of grant um, for what they consider to be the um, excess over and above what they would have expected authorities to budget for. So uh, whereas we had a £300,000 estimated overspend last time, that has now reduced to zero as a consequence of getting grants and the 300,000 being uh, more than it has now transpired to costers. Same with the 600,000 for the non-teachers pay. That was that was very much a, a quite a dirty exercise that was done quickly to, to come up with a figure that we, we thought could have been a pressure, having spent time and, 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 and now paid um, the first month and the back pay for that pay award, um, that 600,000 overspend will not materialise. We do have sufficient in the budget to cover the 2.75% pay award, which is which is a relief and uh, good news. Paragraph 3.20 picks up on the council tax position. Paragraph 3.21 reinforces that we we, we basically bill around about 80 million pounds uh, in terms of council tax, most of it for us, but some uh, in respect of the police and the uh, community councils. We are seeing a modest reduction in, in collection at this point in time, and that will impact us on us by the end of the year. We don't know by how much yet, and at the moment, Welsh Government are considering what either flexibility or support they can provide to reduce that pressure that we may face as at the 31st of March 2021 in terms of our collectible council tax. Um, paragraph 3.25 picks up that although we've concentrated and included the vast majority of the um, substantial elements, there could be non-pandemic related pressures that may hit us uh, between now and the end of the year. There's nothing included for that, but at the moment I'm not aware that we are facing any um, issues and problems with what you would call our base or core budget. We have done some budget monitoring, but again, um, I've been I've been directing our capacity to um, the most substantial areas. So we did spend some time looking at our capital financing budget and paragraph 3.26 picks up on that. <clears throat> we identified having closed the accounts for 1920 uh, and looked at our capital expenditure for the year we're now in, <clears throat> which has been helped by, by some um, quite a lot of grant support from Welsh Government for capital schemes and flexibility. 
we feel that we've got about a half a million pound underspend in the year we're now in in respect to our capital financing budget um so again that's been brought in as a as a mitigation to the position that we thought we were at in september so therefore the table um the table now shows a bit, a little bit higher a pressure a problem of 2.2 million which is nearly half of what it was uh, which means i'm twice as happy as i was um a month ago the 2.2 million um does obviously require uh to be addressed and i guess this is where there's a if you like partial recovery plan which identifies the way by which at this point point in time i believe we should um include a short-term fix uh, by using capital resources and some flexibility we've got <clears throat> to generate half a million pounds from capital receipts to support the revenue budget and just under a million pounds of capital reserves to support the revenue budget. I called it a short-term fix and must admit I didn't like writing that at the time, but you know, when you think about it, we've got all our services providing so much support to so many people, such as services within vulnerable, education, children, public protection, track and trace. The list goes on, doesn't it? And we need to we need to keep everything going and address what we can do with the limited capacity that we've got. So it is a short term fix for that 2.215 million. Um, we did fear a far worse position a few months ago. We feared a quite a bad position just over a month ago. We need to be alert for the remaining months of the financial year. We don't know what's coming. Um, the only thing now is, I guess, that there's less months to be uncertain about. Um, but in those six or seven months that we've got left in this financial year, uh, it is so, in, well, it's impossible to predict where things will go financially. But at this point in time, um, if you approve uh, my suggestions and you can see on table three what they are, then we've got the basis of a of a recovery plan, um, albeit using 748, i.e. the balance to be addressed from our general balances in a temporary way, uh, whilst we look at two things that we didn't have chance to look at, i.e. the departmental reserves to see what can be released, and again, revisit the uh, budget reductions that were planned for, and obviously do as much other reconnaissance on the big budget areas that we can to, as I say, eliminate the need to use our balances to ensure we have a balanced budget come the end of the year. Uncertainty is the key word, isn't it? And paragraph 3.40 picks up on, um, normally we, we're kind of worrying about 21, 22, aren't we? Um, over the weekend, or, no, it was last Friday, I think it was, um, the Welsh Government have responded to the UK Government's delay in announcing their budget for 21-22. And the ink is only just drying on the business planning framework, but already that needs to be changed because now we won't get a draft budget from the Welsh Government until the 21st of December. And the... Um, Settlement will not be announced for local government until the 22nd of December. And that represents 70% of our spendability. So again, we can see how fast paced things are, how things can change so quickly. And again, that just does provide not only uncertainty for the year we're now in, but for next year as well. The Welsh Local Government Association, I think it's today, are just presenting their um, spending round 
survey results from local government to impress upon the Welsh Government how much funding is needed for the different pressures. And we'll have to wait and see how that translates into uh, funding through the settlement for us from Welsh Government once Welsh Government get their funding from the UK Government following uh, some form of spending review. So there you have it, Chair. Um, a kind of balanced position, not as good as I'd, I'd like to have done, but I'm sure that everybody understands um, the capacity issues that we've got and, and how, how important it is to direct the troops to the to the key areas to try and try and come up with um, what I've called um, a quick fix for the year we're now in. Thank you, uh, Andrew. Thank, Thank you, Andrew. For um, I'm sure members are all grateful for all the hard work that you and your staff have put in. For this show, I'll open this now to questions. Um, we start with uh, Councillor Gareth Jones. Hello, Gareth Jones. Do you have a question? Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Andrew, for that report. And I'm happy to understand that the situation looks a bit better um, than a month ago. Can I just say that Barbara had said in the previous report when she was going, when she was talking about Brexit, there was things that we had, we have problems looking in the future about these costs, but there might be additional costs after Brexit in January. The question is, we were talk, you were talking about the possibility of overspend in different areas that we didn't know at this, at this point. Do you feel that Brexit has the possibility to give additional costs in the first months? And are those costs are going to lead to overspenditure in the budget for this year? And those effects on the the next budget as well. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Gareth. Um, I don't know. Um, if they did, then yes, there would be a pressure, but I don't feel that the pressure in the year we're now in would be that great should that position arise. In terms of the WLGA and their paper to the Welsh Government, that did pick up on the issues and risks in respect of Brexit for local government in Wales for a full financial year. And we'll, we'll just need to see uh, how, how governments respond should additional pressures arise and whether that features in their uh, grant support uh, moving forward. But at the moment, um, I can only say, I don't know, yes, but not much. Gareth, Sin Hapis. Gareth, are you happy, happy with that? I'm thankful for that. Thank you. I do agree with Andrew and I accept the explanation. The only problem we have is that Conway is, is going to be vulnerable for social care and losing staff and so forth, and that could go worse in, in Conway's way. But as we say, we don't. We can only look at the possibility at the moment. Thank you for the chance to ask the question. Peter Lewis and then Harry Savile. Thank you, Chair. And I think uh, <coughs> this report, report just illustrates the um, variables that uh, the Department are having to deal with and uh, how things change, literally. I, I know from past uh, comments that Andrew's made literally within a 24 hour period. So I think it's a credit really to the service that they've managed to produce these figures as we are seeing them today. Um, obviously, um, this time of year, 
things that I'm sure Andrew is well aware of is is weather and uh, <coughs> looking at the long long range uh, forecast. Uh, hopefully, it might be wet, but not too much snow. So hopefully, that will make some contribution to going forward. But um, <coughs> I'm happy to uh, propose the recommendations as the listed chair and uh, to add that I'm happy to see that our strategic director is more happy this month than last. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, I've got a proposal. Coun Councillor Harry, have you got, got a question? And are you ready to second uh, Peter Lewis? I, I haven't got a question. I'm just ready to second Peter. Thank you, Harry. Um, I've got uh, Brian Cossey, uh, then Anne McCaffrey and Chris Hughes, and then we'll take the vote. So, Brian Cossey. Yeah, thanks, thanks, uh, Austin. I was just going to second the uh, the recommendations and thank Andrew for his report. I mean, we do understand the capacity issues, and I'm sure we all understand the uncertainty and the big change has been in the last 43 days. So, heaven help us, what the next 43 days are, are going to uh, going to put before us. So. Just to second it, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, hello, Brian. Um, Councillor Anne McCaffrey, your question, please. Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> and thanks, Andrew, for the report. You know, these are really tough times, are they not? Um, and obviously, it's good to see that you um, are able to share with us some information uh, in terms of how we exit where we are for, for this current year. My question, I'm sure you're, you won't be surprised by, it, is around the potential use of reserves. Obviously, you, you've got in your report on 3.39 that um, you want to temporarily use um, a third of our uh, general balances to underwrite the unfunded balance within the recovery plan. Um, and obviously, you know, as a member of the, of the Resilience Task and Finish Group, I just wondered why uh, why you chose to articulate um, the challenge, the outstanding challenge in that way, um, in terms of seeking approval of this temporary underwriting, and indeed, you know, what the implications of it are going forward in terms of um, commitment, really, in terms of reserves going forward. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you will recall the... Um, Financial Resilience Task and Finish Group, um, uh, when our reserves and balances were considered. I mean, interestingly, and, and I guess this is um, one of the issues about looking at a balance sheet, the half a million pound capital receipt that is proposed to be used um, is materialising in the year we're now in. So that was never in our that was never in our reserves to start off with, if you see what I mean. So that's not depleting anything. It's using something that was never there. Um, at the end of the last financial year, but will be in the year we're now in. Um, and, and I guess, uh, do I apologise? I don't have, I apologise. In terms of the resources for capital, I guess, we, we're doing exactly what the government's doing, really. We, we're dealing with a here and now, and it may be that when we come to do some of the um, capital schemes in future years, things will have changed and we could spread the cost of what the £900,000 represents over over a number of years moving forward, as distinct from uh, finding cuts and, uh, and other ways, which at the moment escape me in the year we're now in. Um, it's not right, but it, it's what it's what the world seems to be doing. And um, I guess I'm joining in with the rest of the world as we speak. And uh, I'm not I'm not sure if if. Perhaps that my I've misunderstood therefore what you're proposing here, Andrew. I think I was, I'm quite comfortable with the, the use of capital receipts and the future the capital resources, future future resources. It was the seven hundred and forty eight um, thousand pounds out of um, general balances that, that I was really thinking about when I when I asked the question. Yeah, well, don't forget um, we just using that. I did, I did wonder whether to leave it unfinanced, to be honest, but for completeness, I just took it hopefully temporarily from the general balances. And the other strand is, you know, we'll strive to continue to look for solutions that would mean we wouldn't have to do that. Mm. So I, I guess that's just a mathematical balance up as distinct from 
you know, something that I think is going to happen. Um, like I say, we, we have got other things to look at. We had, we didn't have time to do that. And it may be, it may be that when we get to the end of the financial year or even in our next report, you, you'll see that disappearing, um, hopefully. So it's just to balance up as we speak. And yeah, thanks, Andrew. I completely understand that. I suppose really, you know, I, I came to the same sort of thought that you had is about why not just declare it, if you like, unresolved, really sort of unfunded, as you've called it here. Um, just uh, so it's, 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 a, it's a fine point, really. Um, and I suppose I just don't really want us at this point in time to be heading um, down for approving the use of, of, res of reserves, really. But you know, obviously, this is a, a temporary construct that you know, you, you've put together um, rather than a final commitment. And obviously, I understand and appreciate as well that you've got other, other opportunities to explore and that time um, obviously isn't on your side in terms of doing that. Thank okay. you. Okay, lovely, thank you. Right, finally, Chris Hughes, and then we'll go to the vote. What's your question, please, Chris? Thanks, Chair. I, I, I just wanted to thank Andrew for the for the excellent report that's before us, uh, and to thank him for the perseverance in terms of um, the hard work that went into delivering the, the, the funding before us. I think there was an awful lot of pressure from people to move to a formula base system which perhaps could have been easier but certainly as Andrew said wouldn't have given us the level of funding that we are seeing today and I mean it was interesting I spent some time over the weekend looking at some of the reports on the LGA uh, website and we certainly seem to have done a, a fared significantly better than some of the English authorities. But it's just to thank Andrew, really. I think the amount of work that's gone into this has been phenomenal, but the it's proved that it was well worth it in the results that we have see before us today. And thank, thank you, you, Andrew. Thank you, Chris. Right, then um, we'll go to the vote. I got a proposal from Peter Lewis, a, sec a seconder from, um, I've forgotten now, but I know Brian was willing to second it as well. So. All right. Harry, was it? Thank you. Uh, Sally? Uh, yep, okay, so we'll go to the vote. Councillor Phil Kappa? In favour. Councillor Jeff Corrie? In favour. Councillor Brian Cossey? For. Councillor Pauline Heap Williams? In favour. Councillor Andrew Hinchliffe? For. Councillor Chris Hughes? Obliged. Councillor Wynne Ellis Jones? Obliged. Councillor Peter Lewis? For. Councillor Evard Lloyd. Councillor Evard Lloyd. No, I'm having problems with this sound again. Uh, Councillor Anne McCaffrey. Four. Councillor Dave Rees. Four. Councillor Austin Roberts. Obelaid. Four. Harry Saville. Four. Councillor Nigel Smith. Obelaid. Councillor Joan Vaughan. Four. Councillor Andrew Wood. Four. And Councillor Aaron Wynn. Obliged. Yeah, that's carried, Chair. Uh, Councillor Peter Lewis has got his hand up. Uh, Peter. Uh, well, my, uh, I presume you're going to the next item in terms of the exempt uh, item, Chair. Yes, I am. Uh, well, I, I'm happy to propose it, but one concern I have is that um, uh, some councillors don't appear to be entirely on their own and I hope that they will give assurance that, uh, that they will be in complete privacy in the next item so I'm happy to move it. Thank you Peter. Um, yes uh, that's a good point raised by Councillor Peter. Um, this is an exempt item so can I please ask all councillors to make sure that they that it's only them and them alone that attend this meeting. Okay, thank you. Right, so, um, yeah, have I got a seconder? Seeing as Peter's prompted what I was going to say. Seconder, I have got Councillor Brian Cossie, um, who's always dependable. Thank you. So, right, so we'll be leaving now, and then we will be coming back, and we will be discussing the exempt item. Okay, so see you in a mo. Thank you. Dag